Welcome back, everyone, to Alpha Beta Soup. I'm TXMC. We have a big day to review from yesterday. Bitcoin is back down at 31,000, and a bunch of events unfolded yesterday that it behooves us to discuss. So we'll talk about the drawdown, we'll talk a little bit about Luna and what's going on over there, we'll touch on equities, and we'll also explore some on-chain metrics that we haven't been looking at as closely lately as they directly relate to what's going on with the Luna Foundation. So stay tuned for all of that. If you enjoy this content, please give my video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. The growth of this channel has absolutely blown me away, and you have been more than generous in your support up to now, so I can't thank you enough. But time's a-wasting and we have much to discuss, so let's get into it. Well, friends, I hope you made it through yesterday with all of your Bitcoin bags. Days like yesterday don't come around very often, and when they do, they're quite memorable. In times of crisis and euphoria, FinTwit and Crypto Twitter are the warm, gooey center of the universe. That is where the entirety of the human condition is encapsulated, in people's emotions, in their reactions, and their conversation. There's nowhere I would rather be on a day of chaos than hanging out on Twitter with all the DGENs. So yesterday was an incredible day, and I will not forget it. But it wasn't all fun and games. There was quite a bit of bloodshed yesterday. I mean, we're looking at Bitcoin here on a monthly chart now below 31,000. And yesterday it got as low as 29,700. So many people are wondering today if we've seen the bottom. And it's hard to answer that question directly. But what we can try to do is talk about what's realistic, talk about what we've observed happening, and maybe we can get a sense of what will happen over the coming days. But in a true sense, Bitcoin is a long for the ride with what's going on with equities. And if they continue to unwind at the same pace and direction that they have been, Bitcoin will find it hard to fight against that tide. So let's start here with the monthly chart for Bitcoin. And if we're looking at it, it's clearly broken below its key support structure and is now drifting down to the range lows. These here are around 28,000 800. Now we haven't had a monthly candle close down here in this area since the initial bull run, since the run up in January. That's the last time one of these monthly candles closed below 35,000. We still have two thirds of the month of May for this to play out and possibly recover. We'll see if that plays out. If it does, that would be quite bullish and it would tell a lot about this $35,000 level. But we've got some work to do before we can consider that realistic. Moving down to a weekly chart, it is also broken key structural support on this time frame and is now dancing around here at the lows. We haven't had a weekly candle close down here since December of 2020. We've still got a few days for this to recover. Support on the weekly time frame is around 31,700. So I'd really like to see a weekly close above 31.7 or else it's hard to predict that we would do much more than spend time below 31.7 for a week or two while we recover, possibly longer. And when I say things like that, that's just basic high time frame market structure 101. That's not informed by some complicated fractal of the past. It's just that when you have higher time frames close below structural support, they typically take similar amounts of time frame to recover. So if it's a weekly chart and it closes below support, you can expect at least a week or two before it recovers. That's typically how it works. You can see that right here. Look, we closed below key support and it was another two weeks before we got back over it. Got down here, we closed below key support. It was another three weeks before we got back over it with any real confidence. This is just two of the most recent examples of this. So we'd really like to see the weekly candles holding above 31.7 by the time it closes later this week or the short term prognosis probably calls for a bit lower price action. I'll skip over my three day chart and just go straight to the daily here. And you can see it's not quite as bad as its high time frame counterparts. And that makes sense. It's just a daily chart and it's down here at structural support. That's not a huge confidence builder because as we looked on the weekly and the monthly, we're dancing in no man's land. But the daily chart did manage to find support. It actually found it really crisply right here yesterday on this little wick that ended at around 29.7. 
Now, as we sit here this morning on Tuesday, May 10th, we are getting a little bit of a bounce, but this isn't the kind of confidence-inspiring V bounce that people are probably hoping for, the one that looks like March of 2020. I don't know if we'll get that in this climate, but one thing is for sure. The uptrend has been completely broken. The microstructure uptrend that we had been talking about on this channel has been shattered. So what we talked about in our last video, we have these upward sloping channels. Channels. One of them was on a larger macro stage, and we had tested it a handful of times here on the way up. We also had in red this smaller uptrending microstructure. And we talked about in the previous video, you know, we had broken down into this level, and on camera last week, as I was recording, we got down underneath this channel. Well, that support completely evaporated, and we quickly plummeted down to actual structural lows. So I think that for now, it's safe to assume that these two channels are no no longer really in play and that those uptrends have been broken. So what we have to look for now is an establishing of the range here at the bottom and see what this price action wants to do. If it starts looking like it wants to claw its way back up, then maybe we look for some resistance along this ascending line right here, which I'm drawing freehand, but you get the idea. Maybe we get this kind of bounce, we come down below and then we come up and we test it a couple of times. That may be the best we could hope for. Additionally, when you get these kind of breaks down out out of a previous structure, it makes sense that if you're making a move back to the upside, that people are probably going to de-risk as you approach previous support, which is then going to become resistance. So I freehand drew a trend line here, but you get the idea. If we did start trending back up, chances are we'd find it tough to make it over 38, 39,000. And when you think about how far we fell, 39,000 from here is a 26% rally. So Bitcoin could conceivably rally 25 or 30% from its current levels and not even get back to 40K. Percentages here are important. And when you're still Starting from this low of a level, expecting a 40 or 50% rally, which sends us back up here into the mid 40s, that's asking for a lot. Now, if it happens, I'll be euphoric, but I'll also get extremely concerned as we get up into the high 40s. I don't think that this is realistic. I hear people talking about getting back up into the mid 40s. I think we would struggle to get above this ascending trend line right here, which is maybe about a 20 to 25% rally. This is just conjecture. I don't actually know, but if I'm just kind of talking talking through the market structure here and what we think might play out, that's something I have in my mind as we go forward here. If we pop over and eyeball the equities this morning, yesterday's sell-off was precipitous for them as well. And we can now see the S&P is below 4,000, which it briefly visited yesterday and now is continuing its march lower. Same thing for the Dow Jones and soon the NASDAQ will follow suit. So it seems that yesterday's low prices were not quite the Pico lows. And if these are going to continue to bleed out, it is very safe to assume Bitcoin will probably bleed a little more as well because they've been following each other really closely. So we'll have to keep an eye on this. And you know, one thing about the S&P that is quite interesting is that we are now closer in percentage terms to the pre-COVID high than we are to the S&P's own all-time high from this past January, just a few months ago. The S&P is now down, as of time of recording, about 17.5%. And when you look at the pre-COVID highs, it's only 14.5% from there. Now, many people believe that this level would qualify as the Fed put that that would be a place the Federal Reserve would step in and try to save the markets. So I don't know confidence-wise whether or not this would play out, but I think it's an interesting observation that we are now closer to COVID levels, pre-COVID levels, than we are to our own highs that we were at just a few months prior. This really kind of encapsulates how brutal the first half of this year has been for equities. Now, much of what was causing the drama yesterday was the failure of the UST peg to the dollar. So UST is the Terra Ecosystem Stablecoin, which is directly connected to the Luna token. And the UST peg started disintegrating yesterday morning. It fell down to about 98 cents, then it fell to 94 cents. And then over a period of a couple of hours, the peg collapsed all the way down to around 60 cents. Now, there are a lot of people who think that this is an arbitrage opportunity, that when you see a pegged stablecoin fall below a dollar, you scoop it up with the expectation that it's going to return to being a dollar. That trade feels incredibly risky to me when you consider that it is connected to the already hyperbolically risky Luna ecosystem. 
Now, Luna, for its part, has completely deflated the bubble that was created over the last several months. This is an absolute picture-perfect bubble pop, and it's now back down here at high time frame support. But the Luna token and its corresponding UST stablecoin have treasury to maintain their ecosystem that is backed by Bitcoin. And they began acquiring this Bitcoin earlier this year to much fanfare. And the Bitcoin reserves that they had been accumulating were meant to serve as a backstop for their ecosystem in times of volatility, like what we saw yesterday. So what happened? The Luna Foundation deployed a bunch of their BTC reserves to various market makers to have them defend the peg, to buy UST and try to restore it back to a dollar. Well, you can see they haven't quite done that yet. And when we look at the Luna Foundation's own website, this chart here is showing you their reserve balances in USD terms. And as of today, they are 83% down from their reserve total from yesterday. They deployed virtually their entire reserve to protect the peg in a single day. Now, as I mentioned earlier in the video, a lot of this Bitcoin was deployed to various market makers as a loan to have those market makers buy UST and defend the peg. Some of that Bitcoin will get repaid back to their reserves, but some of it may end up getting sold at some point if the ecosystem doesn't show signs of recovery. They'll almost have have no choice if they intend to preserve the health of Luna and UST. They will have to sell Bitcoin if the market doesn't recover. And during this deployment yesterday, the reason that I really want to bring this up is not because I want to have a video where we talk about Luna. This movement of their treasury caused a ripple in a few on-chain metrics, which for their part also created more drama at a time when the market didn't really need any. And here is one of those places that caused drama. So yesterday saw the highest net inflows of Bitcoin to exchanges since November of 2017. Over 53,000 Bitcoin on net were gained by exchange balances yesterday at a day of precipitous price fall. Now we've talked about exchange balances, about how they are often misinterpreted, how their signal is overblown by many analysts. And I personally don't believe that exchange balances have a direct correlation to price. However, there are a lot of people that look at exchange balances, and when you see a consistent inflow to exchanges by various participants, it implies an intent. Because when your Bitcoin is off of the exchange, when it's in your personal custody, there is a friction between you and the ability to sell that Bitcoin, between you and a buyer. Someone has to make a market for you unless you have a peer to conduct peer-to-peer -peer transactions with. Most people don't have that. They need a market. So to get to a market, you deposit your Bitcoin on exchanges. Now, generally speaking, over the last couple of years, we've seen consistent net outflows from exchanges. You can see most of the extreme values are to the downside here, which shows volume leaving the exchanges. But yesterday, huge deposit in part because of the depositing of Bitcoin by the Luna Foundation to a trio of exchanges. Binance, Gemini, and OKX were the three beneficiaries of the large deposits yesterday. Now, a single day is just an anomaly. It's not something to be concerned about. But if you see folks talking about deposits onto exchanges, if you see mention of this metric, the reason it happened yesterday is because of Luna. And when you dive into which exchanges saw these inflows, it was, as I mentioned, primarily Binance, Gemini, and OKX, which are the entities that Luna used to preserve their peg. So large influx onto exchanges exchanges yesterday, but by my estimation, not materially impactful to Bitcoin's market health and not indicative of investor sentiment changing. Now, if we were to see repeated days of high inflows, maybe that would be suggesting something different to us. But in the short term here, we have a perfectly good explanation for this value from yesterday. Another metric that will undoubtedly make waves when people begin to notice it is illiquid supply. Now, I haven't seen anyone tweeting about this yet today. Maybe I'm the first one who saw it, but illiquid supply took a precipitous fall yesterday. Now, why is that? Well, let me explain just for those of you who are newer to the channel what it is that we're looking at. So illiquid supply is part of a series of liquidity metrics that Glassnode uses, and it's a way of identifying on-chain entities and their likely 
likelihood to spend their Bitcoin. This is based on a couple of layers. The first layer is entity adjusted metrics. On Glassnode, they have a host of metrics that they call entity adjusted, and this is one of them. An entity is an owner of one or more addresses, and through a series of clustering algorithms that are based on ledger behavior, those algorithms identify when multiple addresses likely belong to a single market participant, whether that's an individual investor, a hedge fund, a family office, some kind of public business, whatever it is. And once you get those entities identified, you then have the historic spending history for that individual, and you then know what their inflow and outflow balance is. So we've got a couple of different ways to measure that. Liquid and highly liquid entities tend to have more outflows than inflows. They're more friendly to the idea of transacting Bitcoin. Bitcoin comes in and out of their possession frequently. Highly liquid entities tend to be exchanges and businesses of that ilk. Liquid entities can be traders. They can be frequent transactors of Bitcoin. They can be just anything in between. Illiquid supply represents entities with minimal spending history. So at a three to one basis, most of their transactions are inflows, meaning they are gaining supply. Now, when you see spending by illiquid entities, that is a historical rarity by the definition of them being illiquid. So when you look at their history here, you can see at the May and April top last year, there was a loosening of the growth in illiquid supply. A bunch of coins came to life from entities that didn't have a spending history at that point in time. Well, yesterday we got a big fall in illiquid supply. And by my estimation, it's a direct result of the Luna Foundation Guard. Here you have an entity, a very public entity that owned over 40,000 Bitcoin with zero spending history. We know they don't have a spending history because they just started acquiring in January and their balance has been essentially straight up. So by definition, they were illiquid until yesterday when they deployed, as we explored, the vast majority of their reserves to various market makers, thus making them a highly liquid entity and causing illiquid supply to lose market share. So if you see people today talking about illiquid supply, you now understand what is going on behind this metric. It's because a large entity in the form of Luna Foundation mobilized Bitcoin out of addresses that did not have a spending history. They sent that Bitcoin to several exchanges to defend the dying peg on their UST stablecoin. So I hope that that helps explain a little bit of the dynamics that occurred yesterday. And much of the on-chain activity that took place yesterday was the knock-on effects of these large movements by the Luna Foundation. Another way to corroborate the activity yesterday is by looking at the spent volume of coins that are three months or older. So when we look at older coin spending volume, it's often a proxy for the exit interest of older cohorts. Now, usually volume from this cohort is elevated at times when price is ripping. They're realizing profits, paying themselves for holding their coins for months or years. Here in recent history, the spending out of this group is very small. And when I've got my seven day moving average on it here, it's actually the lowest value we've seen in this entire period on the chart here. If I go back to the beginning of 2020, I wonder how it compares. It doesn't even compare to March of 2020. There's almost no point in the last couple of years when spending volume out of three month and older coins has been this low. So I don't see a capitulation happening out of older hands. There is still spending of newer coins every day. That's no, there's no doubt about that. But the movement yesterday seems to be largely contained with within balances that already existed on exchanges and whatever activity was going on with the Luna Foundation. One thing I wanted to check on today was the percent of supply in profit. This is a really basic metric that just shows the percentage of all Bitcoin supply that exists at a price below the current price. Interestingly enough, this value is down here below 60%. So that means that 40% of the supply currently sits in loss. And the last time we had that much supply sitting in loss was in April of 2020. So 40% of the 
circulating supply was transacted during this recent bull run and is now sitting at a price above 30,000 where we currently are. And I find that pretty remarkable. That shows that nearly half of all Bitcoin is being held from the recent bull run and has not been relinquished yet. It's still sitting in a loss from somewhere above price. Now, some of those people may capitulate, but I would argue that the majority of capitulation has already happened as people have gotten two different opportunities to bail out at what is essentially range lows. We had this capitulation in the summer. We had an opportunity at the end of January. And then yesterday provided another fresh opportunity for anyone who wants off this ride to get off. But we're still seeing 40% of the supply being held from this bull run, basically from January of last year to now. That supply is not being given up, which is an encouraging sign when you consider that Bitcoin is more than 50% down from its all-time high for the third time in a calendar year. So there is still a fair amount of resilience among the hodlers of Bitcoin. There may be weakness in the price, and some of these holders may finally capitulate. But I do find it interesting when you look at the last time we had this much supply in loss was over two years ago. And price has been down from the all-time high more than 50% at numerous occasions in the last year, and we still haven't shaken a lot of these people loose. So I think if you have a longer term thesis about Bitcoin, this can be an encouraging data point after the bloodshed of yesterday to really encapsulate that there are still a great many holders of Bitcoin who have prices from the last 18 months and they have not given up on this asset just yet. So I did think that that was interesting and worth mentioning. Now to kind of put a bow on everything, there was a large inflow to exchanges yesterday, which was the result of the Luna Foundation mobilizing their reserves to defend itself from the loss of their UST peg, which is still not fully recovered. And the deployment of their reserves in defense of this peg means that they have lost more than 83% of their reserves just since yesterday. And if we don't see their ecosystem beginning to recover, if they're not able to restore the UST peg. We may see actual Bitcoin being sold in defense of their ecosystem. It's yet to be seen. I'll never say never on that, but all eyes are on Luna and how well they handle the fallout from yesterday's disaster. We did see a drop in illiquid supply, which as I explained is likely a direct result of the actions of the Luna Guard, who had been identified as an illiquid entity because of their lack of spending history until yesterday when they mobilized more than 80 percent of their reserves. They are now a highly liquid entity. Equities and Bitcoin are hovering at range lows. The S&P is below 4,000, which is the price from early last year, and it's now closer to the pre-COVID highs than it is to its own all-time high from January. There's still a lot of work to be done back to the upside here, and I suspect that over the next couple of days, we're going to see even more volatility. Because you know what's coming up tomorrow, friends? The CPI report. Tomorrow on May 11th, we get the April CPI data. Now there are consensus expectations that it will be below the March value of 8.5%. If that's true, I think it may support, at least in the short term, a slight bounce in equities and possibly in Bitcoin because the market is hoping that inflation gets better. And if they get confirmed of that tomorrow, that's a very small positive development in what is otherwise a very concerning few days. So we'll wait and see what the CPI looks like tomorrow. If it comes in higher than expectations, then all bets are off. The market will probably not like that at all. And we can assume that everything the Federal Reserve told us last week is subject to change. But that is something to deal with tomorrow rather than today. Today, we're looking at weakness across the board after an exhausting day yesterday. But as we discussed, Bitcoin is currently sitting at an 18-month low. It's at the same price that it was at on January 2nd of 2021. And if you have a long-term thesis about this asset as a hard money alternative, as a way to protect yourself from currency debasement, you see it as an exit valve to escape fiat monetary manipulation, then we are sitting at an historic buy zone. So from my perspective, as a long-term investor, someone who doesn't buy and sell Bitcoin with market trends, as long as we 
continue to hang out down here, I will gladly scoop up as much Bitcoin as I can get my hands on. That's not financial advice for you. I'm not qualified to give that kind of advice, but that is how I personally am approaching the levels that we're seeing right now. We're still, from a risk reward perspective, much closer to the lows than we are to the all time high. So for me, that screams value. Make sure you follow me here on Twitter at TXMC Trades. I post a lot of my thoughts and analysis, and on a day like yesterday, I'm tweeting constantly. I've not been yelled at more in my time on Twitter than I was yesterday, and it's because emotions are running high. People are watching their net worths dissolve. They have serious concerns about financial stability going into the future. They're worried about putting food on the table for their families. All of those are very valid concerns, and they're part of the reason why it's hard to have conviction about upside, even after a swift move down like we saw yesterday. The odds are about 50-50 that we continue lower or go higher from here. So at times like this, it is most important that we examine our own conviction, look at our own investment plan, and focus on the factors in our life that we have direct influence over. You have no control over the markets. So if continuing to watch the price is bringing you emotional distress, it's my opinion that you close those charts and walk away. If your conviction in your investment thesis has not changed, as mine has not, then day Days like yesterday are simply an opportunity for you to acquire something at lower prices, if that is your intent. Some of you may find that more risky than you would like, and you'd rather stay on the sidelines. That is also a very valid plan, and it's one you need to decide for yourself. Don't let me or anyone else suggest to you how you should handle your finances on a day like yesterday, or in a climate like we're in right now. That is a personal decision, and it's one that each of us has to make for ourselves. So with all that said, I will let you go. We'll see how the CPI report comes out tomorrow, and how the market reacts to it, and then we may get a sense of what to expect over the next few days. So until next time, take care of yourselves, including your mental health. When the bottom falls out of the market like it did yesterday, it can be extremely stressful. But just know that nothing occurs in a straight line forever, and there will be a day when the market recovers. So it's all about managing your risk and ensuring your survival and health as we navigate these murky waters. That's the most important thing. But all right, I've been rambling enough. I need to get off my soapbox. I hope you guys understand where I'm coming from. We will chat again in a couple of days. So until then, be kind kind to each other. I hope you find a way to enjoy your week and we will chat very soon. Cheers, everyone.